Hi, my name is Chris Lennertz, and uh, I'm a film composer and TV and uh, and game composer as well as a songwriter now, uh, which is fun. Um, done things like Lost in Space, Medal of Honor, um, Marvel's Agent Carter, Horrible Bosses, Ride Along, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, and I love cine samples. <laughs> I, told you, I told you I was going to do that. So my biggest musical inspiration probably changed decade by decade. Um, when I was really young, it was my grandfather. He was a crooner, sort of Sinatra type back in the uh, Boston area uh, before he went in World War II, and he sang weddings and did some shows and things like that. Had an amazing voice, a little Italian, Sicilian guy, um, fedora, the whole thing. And um, and so I really grew up with, with sort of big band at the very start. Um, and then I started playing trumpo when I was nine, probably because of that. I, I, I saw a couple bands and... I think it was right after um, Chuck Mangione became famous. It was that kind of thing. So, so I started that. But then, uh, decade number two, uh, everything changed uh, when sort of I got into middle school, junior high, and I heard uh, heard Van Halen's 1984 album and went, "Wait a second. You know, I heard the the opening solo of Hot for Teacher and was like, "Wait a second. And then I noticed that all the girls thought that was really cool. So I was like, "All right, I need to learn how to play guitar." So I, uh, I, I think it was a Sear, Sears guitar first, and I went and got a, uh, a Sears guitar and learned how to play Eruption and practice and practice, and then spent most of high school, um, you know, playing thing, playing, you know, metal and Van Halen and Metallica and all that kind of stuff. And then by the end, I had sort of gotten through all of that and realized that oh, all the people I really love the most, the guitar players, like you know Steve Vai and people like that, they actually had this love of, of jazz. Um, and so that led me to, you know, Pat Metheny, and and I sort of at that point decided I wanted to go into into jazz. And so I came out to to USC and started as a guitar major, sort of wanting to be a studio uh, guitar player or in a band or something like that. Um, and then decade number three, when I was a sophomore, I ended up going to a uh, recording session, first time in a scoring stage, and I snuck in and. Uh, Ralph Grusin, the piano player, snuck me in and uh, and said, sit here, don't talk to anybody, don't do anything, just pretend like you belong here. And so I sat down there and in walked Henry Mancini. Um, and so uh, I ended up watching this whole day of, of sessions and uh, he told me to call him Hank, which was pretty awesome. And, and the crazy thing was they threw out two of his cues and at lunch he rewrote them in a completely different style. And so it was, it, it, one of them was like a, a classical thing and it ended up literally being a big band chart by like three hours later. Uh, and that to me, as someone who's massively ADD and can't really decide on what kind of music he likes best, it was sort of perfect. So that's where I, I said, okay, I, you know, we were talking about Buddy Baker earlier. He was the head of the USC program. I literally walked into his office the next day and said, hi, I'm Chris, I wanna change my major. I wanna study film composition. Um, and uh, and so that was kind of it. Um, so that was sort of that year, and then and then beyond that, I had I had some really great uh, teachers and mentors. I studied with uh, Elmer Bernstein and Chris Young, and then I got really lucky. And right after college, I worked for Basil Polidoris for four years, um, who's a huge huge influence not only musically but just in terms of you know the way he ran his life and his family and everything. He was just amazing. Um, and then after that, I worked for Michael Kamen for a while, who was also fin phenomenal. Um, so that's sort of where that all came from. And so part of my start was working as an assistant to those guys um, and eventually getting to the point where I orchestrated for Michael and I programmed for Basil. Um, but at the same time, I also was doing student films at USC. Uh, a couple of the people I did student films for, one of them being Eric Kripke, who created a little show called Supernatural, which is going to season 15 this year, um, as well as uh, a couple new shows, uh, including The Boys, which we did this year. Um, it's coming out soon. Um, and Zach Estrin was literally dating the girl in the house next door in college. And he cre he's the guy who's in charge of Lost in Space. And then I met Seth Gordon at one of Eric's barbecues. And he directed uh, Horrible Bosses and Identity Thief and all that stuff. So I really, you know, that was sort of, I got my start both by being an assistant and by being an orchestrator, but also by um, meeting all these amazing, amazing young filmmakers uh, at USC and also, I had an internship at Roger Corman. I can't forget to mention that. So for a year, I uh, I did uh, cue sheets and, and paperwork, and then ended up doing fourteen features in three years. When I first got out of school, for pretty much I pretty much lost money on every one, um, but I met a lot of people, and I and I you know got a a reel, and 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 that all was really great. And I got to do the remake of Piranha and Humanoids from the Deep, and all kinds of good good terrible movies that no one's ever seen. But uh, but it was a really great place to practice and. And all of those things eventually sort of led to 
to where I am. Compositionally, I, I, I don't know whether I benefit or hinder from the fact that I'm a horrible piano player. Um, I literally can't play much more than chopsticks um, because I'm a guitar player. And unless it's a guitar score, that makes it really difficult when you're working with samples and things like that. But because of that, I tend to just write melodies in my head and sing them into a tell into my phone or, you know, I'll run to the piano and just do the melody and then I'll sort of orchestrate and harmonize and, and do that after. So I always pretty much start with a melody or a motive um, or if it's a more of a, ambient or, or, or rhythmic thing, I'll start with something, but I'll, I'll usually start with it in my head. Um, and it usually doesn't come as much as I get frustrated. It doesn't actually come when I'm sitting there. It usually comes when I'm walking the dog or, or um, taking a shower or whatever. And then I'll run and I'll quickly sing it in and then I'll go back and then I'll figure it out and, and, and do all that kind of stuff. But I'll, I'll always start with that first. Um, I do think that like tempo is massively important as the start. Cause, so I'll, a lot of times I feel like I'll watch a scene and spend like literally hours just finding the tempo and and whatever that melodic or motivic thing is. And then it'll be really, really fast to sketch it. And then it takes a long time to to sort of program and produce. And, and I have an amazing team who does a lot of the who do a lot of the, uh, the programming and, and production stuff for me now just to keep us creating music really fast. Um, but I do feel like most of it comes from that. And what I normally do. Um, yeah, I just spotted a new movie last week, and what I try to do is once I'll once I spot the movie, what I'll do is I'll pick like the most important scene for each type of music in the movie. So if there's a love interest, I'll make sure that I actually don't pick the first scene. I'll pick the one where that one sort of culminates, and I'll do the same thing whether whether it's a you know I'll do like the 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 climax and the love scene, and then the big chase, and I'll sort of do those first. And then sort of reverse engineer out of that and do the cues that build up to it. Because I feel like that's where I like to pull a lot of my motivic and, and melodic material from, as well as the bigger cues allow me to sort of flush out the sound of a movie or a show. Um, and then I can do smaller versions and different variations of that cue earlier in the film. But that's that's normally the way I do that. So as far as, far as writing suites, I've done... A little bit of that. I usually write certain scenes, but a lot of times I'll write not to picture. So I'll write, I'll just watch a scene over and over again um, and then write the romantic thing or write the sneaky thing that I know is going to be needed, but I won't necessarily write it sort of slaved to picture. So that way I can make sure the, the, the melody feels musical and natural rather than having some weird shortened phrase or anything like that. Um, so a lot of time I'll do that. I haven't done the sweet thing a lot of, I mean, it sounds like a great idea, quite honestly. I just haven't had time. Um, and maybe I should make time, but, um, but I, but I, 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 uh, I definitely do the same kind of a thing in terms of writing what I would call f like food groups and, uh, and sort of presenting those to the, to the director or producer or whoever. As far as being, being, uh, the composer's job as being a producer now, more, probably than ever before. Um, I think it's it's something that I'm good at, but I'm not sure how much I love to do it. Um, I tend to be really social, and I, I even getting out of SC, I was sort of one of the people who didn't like to be locked in a room and be creative um, by themselves all the time. I got super lonely. Uh, so that sort of drove me to collaborate with other people. And I think, honestly, because I was in bands for so long, and I that's what I did on weekends for social life was, was, was playing in people's garages. I wanted to collaborate with other musicians. Um, so that probably, you know, initially got me to start thinking that that was a good idea. Um, but the schedules have just gotten to the point where, you know, where you, especially on TV, you just need to find a way to get so much music done so quickly um, Lost in Space last year was literally 10 episodes. Some episodes were longer than an hour with almost wall to wall music. So it was close. We did about 500 minutes of score. Um, and about 210 minutes of that was literally live at Abbey Road. And the other 300 was still uh, had to sound great and, and sort of fit all in. Um, so using sort of that as an example, but I, I would say I, use, I do the same kind of thing everywhere. I, as I said, I don't really program 
or get into programming my own cues anymore. That's probably just because it's my least favorite part because it is lonely and, and minutia. But 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 I I you know so I have an amazing team of of people who I'll give a sketch to and then my markers track literally is just like every two bars there's another marker where I'll give you know orchestration advice or or or. Uh, your references of, oh, this should be about as thick as something. Um, when I worked for Cayman, he, there was a cue that he had me orchestrate that, you know, he, puppies were coming down the steps in Hunter on Dalmatians. And he literally said, I think it was, um, I think it was Mozart's first symphony or something. But he said, it's got to be like that in terms of the way the winds work and the way that everything's working. I'm not even a, you know, I'm not like a library of classical music. So I, of course, said, yes, I, of course, I'll do that. And of course, I went, I'm like, I got to listen and look at that really quick. But a lot of times my my marker notes will be, you know, big swell here, harp runs, flute, flute pick, pick gliss, um, timpani roll to here. And then two bars later, it'll, be, it'll say, you know, add, you know, double horns uh, with, you know, clarinets and flutes. And, and so I'll, it'll be this sort of whole roadmap, roadmap, which to me is, is a way for me to get a lot of stuff done really, really fast. Um, and then when it comes to, to having additional writers or having um, people do um, variations of cues for other parts of the movie, you know, one of the things that's, that, that's really difficult for me is that my gut instinct when I'm under a deadline is to say, Oh my God, this is due in three weeks. We have to go just help me. But, um, but what I found is if you sort of get more involved in that first cue, um, you know, my amazing assistant, Dara, who does a lot of writing and a lot of producing for me now, you know, there was at the very beginning, I think I, I tried to just sort of hand stuff off and it was great. And it would come back and it would be super well done, but it didn't sound like me or it didn't sound like the rest of the score. Um, and so we sat here one day and just did one cue together. Um, and, and I said, oh, I would never do that because of this. I would never, I'd never, you know, have the violins doubled with clarinets on a run like this because it's going to sound like Carl Stalling. It's not going to sound like, you know, an action cue or whatever. And so there's little things like that that you kind of only get as you go through that process. Um, and, you know, Tim had asked me, you know, how do you, how do you deal with that? And I think the hard part for me is figuring out what, what makes a score a score or a sound a sound, um, and then finding a way to let everybody know what that's supposed to be. Um, and of course, do it in like no time so you can still finish a huge score in no time. Um, so that's definitely part of the process is is trying to be as clear with notes. And then, you know, I'll honestly, I'll, I'll be I, I'll do things like in a in a in a note, I'll just say, you know what, this thing is supposed to be like family friendly, family friendly Sylvester from the 90s, you know, and it's and it's all my melodies and it's all my harmonies. But I know what that means. I know that means Father of the Bride, and I know that means, you know, piano in the sort of upper register, really sweet, and it probably means, um, you know, light harp and strings voiced in a way that's not too thick and not too busy. So it's like those kind of things I'll, I'll do to try to get us across the finish line faster. Um, and as far as, as far as the collaboration and producing part, um, that's the one thing that I've had a lot of fun with in the last couple years. Um, it kind of started with Horrible Bosses where, again, it was just so literally out of, I know what I'm not good at. Um, and so the director of that movie said, you know, we want it to kind of be Beastie Boys meets the Black Keys, maybe a little bit of Beck. And so I could have killed myself and sat here and tried to figure out how to mock that stuff up or how to like play like that. But that was the first time I was like, well, screw it. I'm just going to go find Money Mark, who played all the keyboards on the Beastie Boys stuff. And I went and found the drummer who played on all the Beck albums. And I went and found, um, you know, the, you know, I ended up getting Mike McCready from Pearl Jam to play guitar. And, and so part of it was me just wanting to basically have a jam session with people I really admire. And, but the other part of this is like, I, I didn't know how to get some of the stuff that, got that Beastie Boys sound. And then literally Money Mark shows up with a 
uh, his he actually has a, a, a one of those really big flatbed uh, you know um, pickup trucks, but like with the extra long one. And there were just it was like a junk store had just unloaded all these keyboards into it. And it wasn't even just keyboards. It was like he had operation the game operation. He had all these like things that were like. They found in you know Japan in the late '80s, and and they were held together by duct tape. But that was how he got all these great sounds, um, and and that's where it really became apparent to me that not only does that make it sound better, because there's nothing worse than a score where the where a composer who doesn't know that style is like doing that style, like like com- like composers who don't know hip hop doing hip hop is just like it's really painful to listen to. Um, same thing with rock. Same thing with metal. Um, and so for me, bringing in specialists who literally, they kind of teach me how to do it along the way. And it's still my like dramatic sense and it's my motives. Um, but that's, that's helped a lot. But the other thing is it makes it so much more fun. I know Hans has kind of figured this out cause he's, he loves to like hang out with all these amazing musicians and, and, and part of it is just literally like, well, because I can, it makes, it makes the sitting in your room alone part way better if you know that for the last two weeks it's going to be you're going to be sitting there with the bass player from you know from Dave Matthews and doing that part of it together so you know so for me I think it's it's twofold it's it's getting it really authentic but it's also literally a selfish excuse for me to not have to sit by myself and 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 do you know do something that that I'm you know that I'm not a not the pro at so I sort of wrangle everybody and, and bring it all together. I give mock-ups very little attention on my own. Um, I feel like, I, I, and this is, this is going to sound like some theory or whatever, but I just feel like there's pretty much one thing happening at each range, like lower, middle, and upper. And that's the important thing. So whether it's violins on a high melody, whether it's an ostinato in the strings in the, in the bottom or low long notes in the bottom and ostinato in the middle, those kind of things will make up a cue and that plus a lot of good direction. So if, if you've got your harmonies, you've got, a, you've got your motor or pulse and you've got your melody and you've got them happening in those ranges so it's wherever they end up being, that plus really good descriptions can get a mock-up to the next level. Um, and then I, I would know what to do, uh, especially and the people who work for me would know what to do. Um, so I think it's very, it's very much a sketch like that. And I think that's, that's the way I would normally do it. I think now the mock-ups have to sound great. I think depending on this, I mean, I think if you have a good relationship with a director and it's a, it's one of those things that's hard to mock up. Like for example, if like, if I'm doing a jazz thing, I can, and it's with a director I've worked with before, I can say, you know what, jazz brass sounds terrible. Trust me, it's going to be great, and I think they'll be okay with it. Um, but if, if it was the first time I'm working for somebody on a big movie and it's jazz, I'd probably just go out and, you know, I'd probably call Rob Share and be like, "Dude, we got to mock this thing up. At least we just need like three players, at least to make it okay." Um, so I, I think that's, you know, I think it depends on on your relationship with them. Um, so when I write, I, I usually write away at least motivically and harmonically or in, uh, in melodically, like I said, sometimes piano, sometimes guitar, sometimes just literally singing. Um, and then I'll go to the keyboard um, and I, I write in Cubase, but everything's synced uh, to Pro Tools. So I, I, I have picturing Pro Tools and all my stems get printed in Pro Tools can, since that's the way we need to sort of deliver to mix. Um, and then, um, you know, I have, I have every, pretty much every library. I have pretty much every, um, every plugin and I'll, you know, I'll use the ones I need to use. Um, but I also don't get down in the weeds in terms of like, I, I, I wouldn't say I, I'm phenomenal at, you know, getting really into plugins to make it do the amazing things I'm sure they can do. Um, but I, I would definitely, I definitely have them and I can use them to, to at least get started on that sort of thing. You know, I think in some ways it's changed a little bit um, since, I started 20-some um, 20, um, years ago. Um, <laughs> but in, in some ways, I give the same advice, which is do everything. You know, a lot of people will ask the question, well, what's, what's better, um, you know, doing indie films and, and small things 
yourself or working for a big composer. And the one thing that I know is that I did both at the same time. I would work for Basil on really big studio movies till six, seven, eight o'clock at night. And then I would go home and I'd write like till four o'clock in the morning for $12 on a movie about strippers who kill each other. And I would, and I, then I'd get up four hours later and go work for Basil again. And there, what I learned from both of those things are completely different. They have, they have almost nothing to do with each other because with big studio movies, watching Basil and especially Michael, who was so great at this, watching the way they handle pressure when you have an $80, $100 million movie and you've got 17 producers and they don't agree with each other. And then the test audience comes back with bad preview scores. And the only thing that changed since the last preview was the music. And so now it's all your problem. Like I saw how they dealt with that and how, you know, smoothly and confidently and, and happily they, they handled all those situations and the pressure and that's something that doing a really small indie movie with one person to answer to and no real money or, or release date, it's just a completely different thing. Um, but then all of those indie movies, especially the, the student films and the shorts and things like that, that I did, I mean, they literally led to all of this other stuff. You know, the, the short films led to Supernatural and Lost in Space, and then their friends led to Horrible Bosses. And, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So I feel like I would try to do both um, either at the same time or take a little time doing one, a little time doing another. Um, definitely don't say no to any of those things. Um, but the other thing that I think is really interesting, the more the more I've even gotten further along is in terms of positioning somebody yourself as um, as you know, somebody that people would want to work with or, or, or hire it. It's not that the music has to be, the music can't, I mean, it, it obviously has to be great, but I think it's more about being a storyteller and being a partner. I think most of the directors that I've worked with, um, especially the ones I've worked with many, many times, like Tim Story or, or Kripke or those kind of guys, what they probably like about working with me is that I, I'm not precious about cues they don't like. I'm not precious about any notes. Um, I never are. I mean, there's, I'm never, you know, the idea of convincing someone that they like a cue that they don't like is, is ridiculous. Like don't, you know, it's not even worth fighting about. It's just like, okay, if you don't like it, it doesn't mean it's not good. It's just, that's not what you see in your movie. But I think it's the idea of being along for a creative ride um, and, and doing things like making sure that, you know, on something like Horrible Bosses where I found out what bands he liked and I went and found the players from those bands and I found the right studio to record at and I made it like a camp out. I made it like we're going to camp out of the studio for 10 days and we're just going to have a blast. And that's, I think, what, what people really want. They want that experience of the creative experience of being in the trenches together um, rather than... I'm going to deliver you the score and, and, and we're not going to really get involved in that way. So I think that's a really big thing. Um, and then I think the other thing that's, it's really difficult at the beginning because especially on low budget movies and things like that. And especially now there's so much pressure to basically sound like somebody else, which you have to be able to do, but I've seen it, a billion times with music supervisors that I work with, I've seen them literally plow through, you know, playlists and, and within seven seconds they'll pop ahead and it's a perfectly good piece of music, but it's, yeah, it kind of sounds like every other piece of music that, you know, that they've heard and they'll stop on the one that's not necessarily as well produced. It might be just a single instrument. It might be um, something that grabs people's attention at the beginning. And I think that's, that's the thing that that amazes me about um, people like Tom Newman or people like John Bryan or Desplat or you know you know any number of people because it's once they found out who they were um, they can you know we talked a little bit about Williams being a chameleon he can really 
you know, move styles pretty easily. And when you listen to to something like uh, Munich versus something like, um, you know, uh, I don't know, like uh, E.T. even, I mean, they're vastly different, but it still kind of sounds, it's still, you could still t- tell it's coming from that same dramatic mind. Um, but I think that's what, Filmmakers really would love to see is that is a is a is a situation where something grabs them right away um, in a in a dramatic sense and in a uh, more storytelling sense than just in a how big was the orchestra or how fast are they playing or how expensive does it sound or anything like that. And I don't know if that's I don't know, maybe that's not the answer that 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 makes a lot of sense. But but I think the the advice I would then have is. Work for as many people as you can in as many different levels of the industry as you can. And then at the same time, figure out who you are and figure out how that relates to each style. Because you obviously have to do every style or a lot of different styles. But I still think that there is something to, you know, if you listen to, you know, Ride Along, which has a definite hip hop influence, and then you listen to something like maybe, um, I don't know, Hop or, um, or or even what I just did for Ugly Dolls. There's definitely there's definitely a storytelling point of view that I feel like you can almost feel is similar, even though they're totally different. Um, and I think I'm, it's still a work in progress. I'm, I think you know, I, I admire how how you know people like Jerry and 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 Elfman and, and and those guys have done that. And and I think that's that's sort of what I strive for is to get to that point where where it's uh, it's sort of your own voice no matter which part of the, no matter which color the chameleon turns. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's, that's probably my advice is, is being able to do that. 